recently by a um, hedge fund manager who earns a little bit more than I do. Um, what is it that wakes me up in the morning? And I said to him, drug discovery does. And, and I, oh, every time I say this, I get like this funny look, drug discovery? That sounds much more fun than a scientist should be doing. But really, he was envious because actually I do have the kind of job that does wake me up very early every morning and makes me just can't wait to get into work. And what I hope today is to tell you a little bit about this job, how we use computers for it, and the intersections between um, computers and biology with a little bit of social networking thrown in as well. So, um, so I'm a computational biologist. That probably tells you precisely what it is. And I work specifically in cancer. Um, and before I start telling you about cancer drug discovery and what we do to discover new drugs for cancer, um, I thought I'd better actually explain what cancer is. And we've had an absolutely fantastic presentation earlier by Kat, who told you about genes and, and how genes work and how genes don't work and, and how actually they encode these things called proteins. And, and normally they're doing fantastic things like making us look so glamorous, um, but sometimes they go wrong. And when they go wrong, we really know about it. So what cancer is, um, like Kat said, you have cells all over your body. You're completely made up of cells. In every cell, there is this amazing two meters of DNA. Um, so here are our cells. And here's sort of zooming in. And here's a little bit of this two meters of DNA. Um, and amazingly, it can happen that a single tiny change in that DNA can make a cell change itself from being a normal cell that's doing its job being a skin cell, for example, to become a cancer cell and start growing completely out of control. And that causes cancer. That's the tumor. Um, the good thing, as a rational scientist and, and reductionist, you say, well, that's fantastic, because now we know about those red spots, the mutations. Then all we have to do is just find them, and then we know what's causing the cancer, and then we know how to drug it. Cancer cured, we all go home. It's all fantastic. Right? Wrong. So here's the problem. Um, can't mention this as well, but let, let's start with this. One gram of tumor tissue, just one gram of tumor tissue, has 10 billion cancer cells in it. OK? That's a big number. Now multiply that number by the 3,000, try again, <laughs> 3 billion letters, the 3 billion points that can be changed can be mutated within that. Um, and you get a really big number that can be different and they can be causing the tumor that we spoke about. But then it becomes even more complicated because actually we do have a lot of mutations in our genes. The reason I don't look as beautiful as you or as sleepy as you um, is, <laughs> is because actually we do have differences in our genomes and we do have mutations. So actually, on average, every single one of our cells has um, 10 million mutations that are completely benign, that just make us who we are. And so what we need to do is find that single mutation that is causing the cancer among all of those trillions of potential letters and find out which one's causing cancer as opposed to the 10 million that are not causing the cancer. So forget needle in a haystack. This is a needle in a needle stack. This is pretty difficult stuff. But that's OK. That's where my second love after biology comes in, which is computers come in. And there's lots of clever people, not me, but lots of clever people who have spent a lot of time taking um, tissues, taking cancer samples from patients, generating hundreds of terabytes of data, thousands of terabytes of data now, Coming up with, I'm not even going to attempt reading the numbers, it's clearly too late for me to read numbers at the moment. Um, but also developing really smart computer programs to try and help us hone in from these endless possibilities of what might be causing or driving the cancer to just hundreds of candidates for any one particular type of cancer that we can start rationally working through and thinking through. And from now, I'm going to call these potential mutations, these potential genes that are encoding proteins that have gone wrong that may be causing the cancer. I'm going to call them targets, and you'll see why in a, in a moment. So this is where I come in. Um, so I work in the Drug Discovery Unit at the Institute of Cancer Research, and it is our job to actually find out what's causing the cancer and discover drugs for it and put them in the clinic. And we're pretty good at doing that. So I'm going to tell you about um, a really nice, simple example that is a fantastic success story and you know, shows you how you can really be reductionist and rational. Um, this is an enzyme. It's called BRAF. 
It is encoded by the gene BRAS. Um, doesn't mean anything. Um, and it's there. It's, it's in our body. It's in every cell. And it's functioning normally. Actually, we need it to function normally. However, we discovered that a single point mutation, just one single letter change, causes melanoma in the vast majority of patients. This discovery was made actually by sequencing the DNA, by, by profiling a lot of different melanoma patients and identifying, applying the smart computer programs and identifying that, that this was happening. And that was really brilliant because we've got fantastic technologies that allow us to know what this thing looks like in 3D. Once you know what it looks like in 3D, it becomes like a game of Tetris. You can actually design a drug, a small molecule, a small chemical that can fit inside BRAF. And that's an actual structure of the BRAF enzyme with the drug sitting within it. And that makes BRAF the target of that drug. And it's fantastic because for the first time ever, we saw actual remission and actual um, treatment for melanoma patients. And that was really, really fantastic. And it's come out from being able to rationalize this. So that's the success story. But of course, sadly, biology, love it as, I'm, as I can, is not reductionist. Biology always has, yeah, it's kind of like that, but. But here's where computers come in. Because the more data that we are gathering, the more patients that we are profiling, the smarter our computer algorithms are becoming, the better we are becoming at discovering drugs for cancer. So now I'm going to tell you about my lovely world of drug discovery, very glamorous world, uh, where we start with these target candidates that I told you about, these ideas that I think this gene might be driving that particular cancer, might be driving that particular type of lung cancer, and it could be that if we could develop a drug for it, that we would kill that type of particular um, lung cancer. So we have this idea, and then we enter the cycle that can take five years, that can take 10 years or more, where we do experiments to validate whether the target is really driving the cancer. We make endless hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of compounds to test against it. And we test and we go round and round in circles. And we have a lot of failures. That's the reality. And that's why drug discovery doesn't get us there as often as we really want it to. Because you fail a lot of the time. Your hypotheses were just wrong in the first place. And you need to do the experiment to find out. But it's brilliant because sometimes also you do succeed. You enter clinical trials, you find efficacy in your patients, you start treating the cancer, and you get a drug approved. And we've had that. Um, just a few years ago, we had a prostate cancer approved that we've discovered in our laboratories that we've pushed through the clinic. And it's benefiting prostate cancer, late stage prostate cancer patients um, all over the world. And we're very happy about that. As a computational biologist, I thought, well, we're gathering so much data, all the compounds that we're generating and testing, all the targets, all the genes, all the proteins, so much data, albeit coming from different parts of the world. You know, there's biology, there's chemistry, there's all sorts of different information that we're collecting. And my question was, can we rationally analyze and, and use these big data techniques, put them all together in some big soup, and see if we can decide which of these targets to follow up right from the beginning to make us go through this loop a lot less than we do at the moment and sort of hedge our bets much better at which targets we want to pick. And it turns out, yes, you can. Now, we have quite a lot of data, huge amount of data, actually. And what we discovered a few years ago is that there are genes that cause cancer. We can um, find them like that BRAF gene from analyzing these patient samples, and it's great. And then there are genes that can become drug targets. Their proteins can become drug targets. Um, and actually, they're not exactly the same set of genes, and they're not exactly the same set of proteins. And so the question was, can we develop computer algorithms that find the sweet spot, the targets that both drive the disease, drive the cancer, and can be drugged with a, with a drug? Um, and here's my attempt at showing you a video. Let's see if it works. This is a protein. It is a protein that's involved in the synthesis um, of testosterone. And this protein is really important in prostate cancer. That is our drug that was approved in prostate cancer. And as you can see, it fits really snugly inside this little cavity, this cave inside the protein. And it's beautiful. I think it's, it's really awesome. This is genuinely inside our cells. 
And our drug blocks the action of this protein and stops really advanced metastatic prostate cancer from advancing, giving prostate cancer patients a much happier, healthier life um, and much better than anything that could be done before. And that's really cool. And so what we did was we developed these algorithms where we took all of the proteins that we could find, hundreds of thousands of them, that we know their three-dimensional structure like this, and what we did is we um, found ways of just teasing out these cavities and just looking at the cavities on their own and then measuring everything about them, measuring how big they are, how deep they are, how charged they are, also how greasy they are, everything that we could measure about them. And then we developed machine learning algorithms um, that learn from the example that you've given them before. And then they can see a brand new protein that they've never seen before and tell you whether there's a chance that this protein might make a good drug target or whether it's likely to be one of those failures that make you go around the loop again. And it turns out we're pretty good at doing this. We're not, you know, 100% foolproof, but it, we are pretty good at doing this. So good at doing this, in fact, that now our drug discovery at the Institute uses this technology all the time for us to pick which targets we're going to work on. Not just that, we've published it, we've showed it to the world, and we know many places around the world are now using the same technologies to help them decide which cancer drug targets to work on. And one thing I will say about science and the utility of computers is it allows you to be a good citizen. So we are an academic institution, we are discovering drugs, but also we want everybody else to help us discover the drugs. There's so much to do, there's so much work to do. And so we've developed this database that brings together all the information that I've told you about, brings together these predictions, it's called CANSAR, and we've made it available freely to the world. Um, and this is a map of where in the world that's using it. And people who know me know that I get really annoyed that Svalbard are not using our database. So if you know anyone in Svalbard, it is absolutely your responsibility to get them to click at least once um, on the database. So that's our database. So there's good news, and then there's not so good news. The good news is actually almost 50% of our cancer patients are now cured using the current therapies, be they drug or be, be they surgery, radiotherapy. But of course, the other side of that point is that almost 50% of cancer patients are not cured. And what's more is that cancer cells start behaving not like human cells, they start almost behaving like infectious disease or bacterial cells. And so you can develop drug resistance in cancer just like you can develop drug resistance for bacteria or MRSA that you hear about on the news. So what are we going to do to do to do that? Well, to try and treat the rest of the cancers, we're working really hard to find those cancer drivers and try to drug them, like I said to you. But what do we do when we even drug something? Actually, like that BRAF example that I've showed you, now patients are, the cancer is recurring. So what do we do when that resistance arises? Now, there's lots of reasons why the resistance arises, and there are lots of smart ways to try and tackle it. And today, I'm going to tell you only about one of the ways that we're starting to study them and, and, and tackle them, which is social networking. Now, that's the answer to everything I know. That's what that does. That's my stepdaughter says. Anyway, so this um, is actually the social network, the way the proteins within a cancer cell interact with each other. Each point on this network is a protein, actually a prostate cancer protein, and every line that connects every dot is a connection between those two cancer proteins. And the colors, the greens, show you where the drug targets are sitting, so the ones that we can drug with a small molecule. This is only a small network. This is just the network of prostate cancer proteins and a small number of them that we've been looking at. Now imagine this for the 20,000 proteins um, that, that Kat had mentioned before. We have a lot of those sloshing around every cell, a lot of copies of them sloshing around every cell. And you can represent them really with this massive social network. Uh, and this picture always really sort of amazes me. So there are three other networks that look pretty much like the one I showed you. So connections, every dot is, say, a protein, and, and every line between two dots is a connection between the two proteins. And, and they're sort of different representation of basically the same thing. But they're not actually all protein networks. It's really interesting. Those are computers on the World Wide Web, and the lines are connections between the different servers. 
This one is some friends on Facebook. I'm not going to say who's really popular and who's Billy No Mates. And this is the human cellular wiring network. These are the proteins that are interacting inside our cells. And the interesting thing about this representation is it suddenly opens up a whole area of science to us to allow us to analyze cancer, which is social networking. So you can actually apply network analytics to identify information, not just in the data themselves, but in their structure, in how they are connected with each other. Um, so, um, I won't talk you through many examples, but basically that's what we did. We took this network, the social network of, of human proteins, and we applied many different um, network analytics. We asked, you know, for proteins, which ones have lots of friends, which ones don't have very many friends, which, which um, have a lot of traffic, communication traffic gone between them, um, you know, which ones are, uh, I don't know, organize all the parties and et cetera. Um, so we asked all of these questions, and we found something really striking. So statistically, we found that cancer drug targets, proteins that are really good for cancer, um, behave very differently in terms of their social interactions to your average protein in the cell. So differently, in fact, and so statistically, statistically significantly, in fact, that we were able to build very strong predictive models to tell you, based just on the interaction, nothing else, based on those social interactions, which ones are likely to make good cancer drug targets and which ones are not. And this now is part of our computational modeling system that we use in order to select our targets. But the other side effect of this was very interesting because it turns out that actually a lot of drug resistance happens um, because you may block one of these communication nodes in, in the cancer network and then a little bit like, uh, I don't know, the RMT strike, for example, <laughs> most of the time you can actually bypass it, although today wasn't so easy. Um, most of the time you can actually bypass it by just simply taking a different route through the network. And so, as a side effect of what we did, we discovered that actually we can make predictions about you know, which two stations in the network you want to block at the same time in order to maintain the anti-cancer effect of the drugs. And that's called drug combinations, where just like antibiotic combinations or, for example, um, HIV uh, drug combinations, you give a combination, a cocktail of drugs that act in such different ways um, that help you maintain the effect um, of, of the drug. And so that's what we're doing at the moment. And actually, I've got wave, wave, because I am going to embarrass you. I've got two fabulous students in, in, in the audience who have been working on this, both the structure and, and finding where to drug a protein. Uh, but also, Lizzie is actually doing this at the moment on non-small cell lung cancer, working uh, with clinicians at the Royal Marsden in order to identify what are the best personalized drug combinations for every patient at any one time. And we hope to take those into clinical trials sometime next year. So that's all very exciting. What's next? We can conquer the universe. Now we've got biology and we've got computer and social networking. There's nothing that can stop us. So here's the dream. The dream is we're going to go back to thinking that no two patients are ever alike. No two tumors are ever alike. And the tumor changes over time and in response to its environment and therapy. Two patients seemingly with the same kind of tumor, both of them presenting with breast cancer, but one of them is diabetic and the other one isn't, or one of them is a smoker and the other one isn't. Their tumors are going to be different. And so here is our plan, and we have already started doing this. For every one of our patients, we will be collecting as much profiling data on them as we can. Their genomes, their DNA sequences, MRI scans, any kind of information that we can, can get about the tumor. After they receive their treatment, we keep monitoring. And if we need to modify the treatment, we use our smart algorithms in order to give them just the right combination of drugs or therapies um, in order to get them through. And we can go through this cycle as many times as it takes until we either cure the patients or um, we continue with their palliative treatment. This seems very futuristic if you come from drug discovery or from the medicine world, but I genuinely believe that it's absolutely within our reach. It's taking the working together of big teams that are bringing different expertise from biology and chemistry and the clinic. Um, it's taking the integration of data from all sorts of areas that never spoke to each other before. We're speaking to physicists all of a sudden. Whoever thought that biologists would ever do that? Um, 
But we do, and we will. And then the really amazing thing is just the power of computers when you've got the right people using them. We will be developing machine learning and artificial intelligence um, methodologies to help us guide the therapies so our clinicians can go armed with the best information, with the best suggestions, so they can give the right treatment to the right patient at the right time. And that, I don't think, is science fiction. I really think that it's not in the too distant future. And at the end, I just want to thank uh, very important people. Cancer Research UK um, has funded much of the work that I've talked about today, and, and they continue to fund us, and we're very grateful to them. This is my amazing team um, that have done the work. I just get to talk about it. Um, and one thing I would say for any female scientist or engineer, we all benefit from amazing mentors, and these mentors can be female or male, and, and my mentor is Professor Paul Workman, who's, who's really believes in the power of computers and how it can benefit therapy. And of course, my husband and my little son, because you've got to see a cute picture. And thank you.